blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says or perhaps hard to want to take it in. It is so uninteresting. And yet I want the other to be about me. I dread the moments when the house is empty. If only they would talk to one another and not to me. There are moments, most unexpectedly, when something inside me tries to assure me that I don't really mind so much. Not so very much, after all. Love is not the whole of a man's life. I was happy before I met H. I have plenty of what are called resources. People get over these things. And then comes a sudden jab of red-hot memory and all this common sense vanishes like an ant in the mouth of a furnace. Lewis laments his loss. He is raw in this book. He is honest. He wrestles with his doubts and with his faith. His grief gives way to lament as a means of owning the weight of the loss and processing the grief with which he wrestles. And that is exactly what David is doing in our Bible text today. David receives word that King Saul and Jonathan are dead, killed in battle with the Philistines. David has been on the run from Saul. Ever since David killed Goliath, people were singing this song. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. That song became an earworm in Saul's head. He can't get it out of his head. He keeps hearing it. He hates this song. Saul sees David as a threat to his throne. Saul is jealous of David, and so he pursues David. He hunts him down like a dog. In Saul's twisted mind, David is public enemy number one. His picture at every post office in Israel. If you see this man, do not approach. Notify the authorities immediately. He travels with a gang and is armed and dangerous. Saul hated David and wanted him dead. Saul's son Jonathan and David are best friends. But what's a son to do? Torn between the loyalties to his father, the loyalties to his friend. Jonathan tried to convince his father that David was no threat to him. Saul wasn't buying. He wants David dead. But God won't let that happen. Twice in Saul's pursuit, David had the means and the opportunity to kill Saul but didn't. Wouldn't lay a hand on his king, respects him too much, respects God's anointing too much. The prophet Samuel had already anointed David as the next king, but David insists that God's providence should work out that timing. And the time came. David and his men are in one area of Israel. They are routing the Amalekites. Saul and Jonathan are in another area in combat with the Philistines. David wins his battle. Saul loses his battle and his life. Elsewhere on the front, Saul's three sons, including Jonathan, are killed in action. And in the heat of battle, a Philistine releases an arrow. It strikes Saul and mortally wounds him. Saul had seen enough of this kind of wound to know that he, that he is a dead man. All the corpsmen in the army, all the doctors in the best hospitals in town can't save him now. So Saul says to his armor bearer, draw your sword and finish me off. I'd rather die by your hand than by the hand of these uncircumcised Philistines. They will do terrible things to me before they let me die. Saul's armor bearer refuses. He is not going to kill his king. So Saul falls on his sword and kills himself. His armor bearer does the same, and that is that. When the Philistines find Saul and his sons the next day, they strip Saul of his armor, they cut off his head, and they hang his body in Bethshan on a wall. They hang his sons on the same wall. Some of you will remember the images from Somalia in 1993 when the Somalian thugs dragged the body of one of our dead soldiers through the streets of Mogadishu. That's what these Philistine punks are doing to Saul and his sons. They hang on that wall, dead men, until some brave Israelites sneak in, take the bodies, take them home, and give them a decent burial in Israel. Shortly after that, David gets the equivalent of that middle-of-the-night phone call with bad news, news that's unexpected, the news that someone you love has died. He doesn't get the full story. He doesn't get a completely true story, but he gets the most important truth. Saul and Jonathan are dead. There's no celebration at this in David's camp. No group chorus of ding dong, the witch is dead. David and his men, they burst into tears. They rip their clothes in grief and they mourn and fast till evening. And then David offers a lament, a lament for Saul and Jonathan 
That's what's recorded in our text. And I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. David sang the following lament for Saul and his son Jonathan. And he ordered that the Judahites be taught the song of the bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. The splendor of Israel lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Do not tell it in Goth. Don't announce it in the marketplaces of Ashkelon. Or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. And the daughters of the uncircumcised will celebrate. Mountains of Gilboa, let no dew or rain be on you, or fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul no longer anointed with oil. Jonathan's bow never retreated, Saul's sword never returned unstained from the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty. Saul and Jonathan, loved and delightful, they were not parted in life or in death, they were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxurious things, who decked your garments with gold ornaments. How the mighty have fallen in the thick of battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were such a friend to me. Your love for me was more wondrous than the love of women. How the mighty have fallen in the weapons of war have perished. David grieves. Listen again to verse 17. David sang the following lament for Saul and his son Jonathan. And he ordered that the Judahites learn the song of the bow. David grieves. He feels his personal loss and the loss for Israel. How the mighty have fallen. When the mighty fall, there is more permission to grieve. I mean, it's all over the news. Flags are flying at half mast. Everybody's talking about it. And I was in Just in second grade when John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, I heard the news at school. I remember feeling stunned and seeing adults cry. I remember black and white television images of grief around the event. The world stopped and paid attention to the loss. And other deaths have stirred similar emotion. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Robert Kennedy, the shuttle explosion in 86, the Twin Towers, In 2001, Princess Di, how the mighty have fallen. But it's important to pay attention to any loss in our lives. Your father, your sister, your friend, they they may not have been mighty outside their small circle, but such persons were mighty to you. And so it's it's good to give give yourself time to grieve. And you'll find that some want to hurry you along when you're grieving. Uh, Your loved one dies on Wednesday. Your boss says, I'm sorry to hear it. Take the rest of the week off. We'll see you on Monday. Your spouse dies. You have the funeral. And some well-meaning family member or friend comes alongside you as you're walking from the grave and says, now I'll be by tomorrow and we'll start cleaning out those closets. You, You suffer a miscarriage. And someone close to you leans in and whispers, you're young. You have plenty of time to have more children. Your child dies. And trying to comfort you, a friend says, well, at least you got more children and even grandchildren. Our culture says, race past death, ignore your grief, man up and be okay. It's hard not to try this because there are jobs to get back to and there's kids to manage and laundry to do and duties to perform. Life goes on, right? Well, yes and no, life does go on. How can it not? But it's a different kind of life without the one that you love. So acknowledge that and own that and grieve that. And write your lament. In his book, Don't Take My Grief Away, Doug Manning writes, you must give yourself permission to grieve. You're going to grieve whether or not you give yourself permission to do so. The difference is that if you do not give yourself permission, then you'll be in a state of war with yourself during the grieving process. If you do give yourself permission, you can relax and not fight against yourself in the process. To fight against yourself can lead you to act well before you are well, and acting well only prolongs your grief. You give yourself permission to grieve by recognizing the need for grieving. Grieving is a natural way to work through the loss of a love. Grieving is not weakness. It is not absence of faith. Grieving is as natural as crying when you're hurt, sleeping when you're tired, or sneezing when your nose itches. It is nature's way of healing a broken heart. 
So don't ignore your grief. Don't pretend it isn't real. Don't pretend you're okay. Don't pretend it isn't important. Pay attention to your grief. Sing, moan, speak your lament. Though the stages of grief are pretty consistent, we will work through those stages in our own way and at our own pace. Every loss is going to mean something different to every griever. But did you notice in our text how David, how David processed his grief? He wept, he mourned, and then he wrote a lament, which is something akin to a eulogy. And you can hear, did you hear in his lament a little anger and a little bitterness in verse 20? Don't let those Philistines hear this lament and throw a party and dance on the graves of Saul and Jonathan. And in verse 21, David also cursed the very place where Saul and Jonathan were slain in battle. Let no dew or rain fall on you, mountains of Gilboa. Anger's common to grief. Why didn't he go to the doctor sooner? I told him, go to the doctor. I told her, don't you ever text and drive. It's the doctor's fault. It's the hospital's fault, and I'm going to tell all my friends. Don't be afraid of any anger that wells up in your grief. Listen to it. Pay attention to it. Process it. Pray it. That's what David's doing in this lament. And notice that he also focuses on the best in the lives of Saul and Jonathan. Now that was really easy for him to do with Jonathan because they were best friends from youth. The message translates verse 26 this way, Oh, my dear brother Jonathan, I am crushed by your death. Your friendship was a miracle, wonder, love, far exceeding anything I've ever known or ever hoped to know. David lost a part of himself in Jonathan's death. It's easy to heap praise on those for whom we have natural affinity and natural love. But did you notice that David was also able to see the best in Saul, the very person who made his life miserable so much of the time? David likened him to a gazelle, to a lion, to an eagle. Said he blessed Israel with so many good things. David had the capacity to separate the marginal from the important. And in Saul's death, David determined to remember and honor the best in Saul rather than brood over the worst. Now this is not a denial of Saul's weakness. This is a celebration of Saul's strengths. Saul was God's anointed Eugene Peterson captures it. What God did for Saul far outweighed anything that Saul did to David. And that is what David chose to deal with. God's grace in Saul's life rather than Saul's hatred in David's life. When you grieve those who've treated you wrongly, an abusive parent, adulterous spouse, some rebellious kid, a vindictive sibling, it's important to remember about them what David remembered about Saul. Saul didn't destroy David. You've obviously outlived the deceased that caused you so much grief, who treated you so badly. It is healthy to acknowledge the pain that they caused, but it's healthier still to forgive them and to seek to remember the better parts of who they were. Choose to remember God's grace in their lives rather than their hate, neglect, or meanness in yours. My dad hurt me in a million ways in life. But choosing to focus on his better angels helped me help keep my grief from getting bitter and sour over him. It will help you in your grief too. Holding on to the best frees you from the pain that they caused and it opens up deeper healing even in your grief. David teaches us how to grieve here. And maybe his most obvious help is this. Write a lament. Write a lament. That helps me process my grief when I do your funerals. I've been here so long, I don't bury church members, I bury friends. So I grieve too. And it helps me to write my lament for them. That's what I do in funerals. That's what I share in funerals. And it will help you if you write your lament for your loved one. Think through your loved one's life. Pray over your memories. Record them as a song to God. Record them as a letter to the deceased. 
You may not be poetic like David, you may not be a preacher like me, but, but you can write something, something from your heart, something that helps you process your grief, name your emotions, pray your pain, let go of old bitterness, celebrate the best in your loved one, and take note of God's grace in his or her life. Don't you think that's worth a try? That's how David attended to his grief. He can help us attend to ours. And maybe that's the takeaway from this sermon. Pay attention to your grief. Though it can be bitter, grief is a great teacher. When we pay attention, when we take a few notes, grief says don't deny death, face it. Grief says don't ignore pain, engage it. Grief says don't handle your grief alone, take it to God. And when you do, you'll find that no matter how deep your grief is, God is deeper still. Only those who come to grips with their loss will find their way to the healthy place and the brighter day, and God will help you get there. John Claypool tells the story of a pipe-smoking friend of his whose five-year-old son made his dad an ashtray uh, for Christmas when the kid was in kindergarten. Boy started working on, uh, working on it in October. His art teacher, you know, helped him fashion the clay into the rough form of an ashtray because his dad's favorite color is blue. He decided he'd paint that thing blue, and he did. And then when he fired it, that ashtray began to shine. The boy grew more excited with every single step of the process. I mean, he could envision Christmas morning already, his dad sorting through all those store-bought presents from everybody else, and then when he gets to the, to the gift that his son had made him, made him with his own two hands, his dad would be so thrilled, so pleased, so excited. Well, the last day came before the Christmas holidays. The school had a little pageant. Every parent came to support their kid, and somehow, uh, between leaving to get his coat, grab his gift, running down the hall, waving goodbye to his friends. The boy tripped and there it went. And then the crinkling and crunching of breakage on the floor. The work of the autumn, the hopes of Christmas Day crashing down with his present and the boy cried like it was the end of the world. The boy's father saw all this happen. He had a military background. He was kind of embarrassed about having his boy crying like this. So he walked over to him, kind of patted him like some Prussian general said, uh, don't cry, son, doesn't matter. Doesn't really make any difference. Of course it matters, his wife exclaimed as she pushed her husband aside and scooped that boy up in her arms. It always matters when something precious has been broken. So she joined his weeping. The weeping that's always appropriate when anything precious is broken, when anyone precious is lost. She took her handkerchief, she dabbed his tears, she dabbed her own, and then she said, come on, son, let's, let's pick up the pieces, take them home, and see what we can make of what's left. And that's what David is doing in his lament. He's acknowledging what he lost. He's owning the pain of it. He's owning the depth of it. And yet, the lament is not the last word. There's something left for David. There is a life to be lived. There are battles to be fought. There are joys to celebrate. There are sorrows to be carried. And in God's good time, there's even a death for him to die. But David is better equipped to launch out into all of that because, and, and make something of what is left because he takes time to grieve. And he takes time to reflect upon his losses. He takes time to lament. So learn from David. He's no stranger to grief. And most of you aren't either. And we have. We have what David didn't have. We have Jesus. We live on the backside of Jesus' cross and resurrection. We have Jesus. We have the forgiveness of Jesus. We have the righteousness of Jesus. We have the peace and the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Jesus, the one who holds the keys to death in the grave. 
We have Jesus, that friend who sticks closer than a brother, the man of sorrows acquainted with grief, the one whose strength is made perfect in our weakness and whose grace is sufficient for our needs. We have Jesus. We worship a living Savior who has proven that death doesn't get the last word. Life does. And grief doesn't get the last word. Comfort does. And tears don't get the last word. Joy does. As David said in another lament over in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saves those crushed in spirit. We have grief, but we have Jesus. And he is a partner in your grief like no other. So lean into him and he will help you pick up the pieces of what is left uh, from your loss and make them into something that honors your loved one, assuages your grief, and brings glory to God. Thank you, Father, for meeting us in our grief. Thank you for walking us through its darkest places and through those days when we feel like, hey, we will get through this and everything will be okay. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us today. We have people in this room and online, watching online, who are grieving, who are coming, trying to come to grips with, with a very significant loss in their lives. Our prayer is that you will even just now give them some sensible, tangible touch of your presence. You will enter into their doubts and give them faith. Enter into their despair and give them hope. Enter into their chaos and give them peace. Enter into their sorrow and give them joy. Do your work in our lives. Your healing, tending, saving, mending work in our lives. In Jesus' name.